we are going. Heaven knows where we are going. Heaven Good morning, beloveds, and welcome to the live online Sunday service of the Unitarian Universalist Church of Urbana-Champaign. I am the Reverend Florence Kaplow, the lead minister of your church, and we are live streaming from our sanctuary this morning. If you are visiting this morning, and this is your first service, welcome. We are so happy that you have found us. This Sunday is the second Sunday of our annual pledge campaign. And the theme this year is beloved community. We have an honored guest speaker this morning, Paula Cole Jones, a nationally revered UU leader and racial justice activist. You will hear a conversation between us 
about the continued journey of this congregation and of Unitarian Universalism toward beloved community. Each Sunday, as part of our commitment, our ongoing commitment to waking up to racial justice, we begin our services with a land acknowledgement of the indigenous peoples of this place. And wherever you are in the country today or in the world, please bring to mind the indigenous peoples of your place as I say these words, and we'll have a moment of silence afterward. We recognize and acknowledge that we gather today on indigenous land, taken through deception, coercion, and violence. We acknowledge the continued displacement and oppression of Native peoples and honor their commitments to survival, identity, and the protection of our world. Thank you. And whether you are sorrowful or joyful this morning, tired or rested, hopeful or despairing, whether you have joined us today out of love, conviction, a wish for community, or simple curiosity, you belong here because you are here. And all that you feel and all that you are are welcome here. This morning, we are, each and every one of us, even apart, the heartbeat of this congregation. We light this chalice as a symbol of our Unitarian Universalist tradition to mark this time together as special and worthy. If you have a chalice or a candle at home, we invite you to join us in this lighting ceremony. As we kindle this flame, we recognize our commitment to the mission of our congregation to build community, seek inspiration, promote justice, and find peace. Thank you, Walt and Eileen. All of our UU children and anyone who stays around a UU congregation for a while, hears about our UU seven principles. These principles guide us as Unitarian Universalists. I often say though that they are descriptive of us rather than proscriptive and they are open to change as we are. Since today, Paula Cole Jones and I will be in conversation about the eighth principle project, we thought a little reminder of our seven principles for all of us would be fun. As you may know, the adult version of the seven principles is pretty wordy. But the great thing about something for children is that it can be something for all of us. Joe Reichlin and his ukulele uh, is here to remind us. Good morning to all. Today, let's start with our seven principles. They're a very good place to start. We established them in a thoughtful and extended democratic congregational process of discernment in 1984. And I know we all know them by heart. One, each person is important. Two, be kind in all you do. Three, we help each other learn. Four, and search for what is true. Five, all people have a say. Six, work for a peaceful world. 
seven, the web of life's the way that will bring us back to me and you, you. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. Welcome, welcome back, Paula Cole Jones. You were with us, many of the leaders and others from the congregation in the fall. Michelle Grove invited you here to uh, explore the concept of community of communities. Uh, it was very rich, two days uh, that people did one or the other with you. So it's wonderful to have you back, truly. And uh, we're so happy that you could join us during this month where we are really dedicated to exploring the ideas and the vision of beloved community. And I'd like to begin by introducing you uh, for those who were not able to attend your workshops in the fall. You are a lifelong Unitarian Universalist, uh, and a lifelong uh, member of the All Souls Church in Washington, yeah. D.C., one of our truly great churches. And uh, as well, you have been on the staff with the UUA and an um, important um, you know, president of uh, DRUM, uh, diverse Unitarian, revolutionary Unitarian Universalist Ministries, as well as being an elder with Blue, Black Lives of UU, and uh, um, one of the architects and, and holders of the vision of uh, the Eighth Principle Project. And that's part of what we'll talk about today. But where I'd like to begin, uh, you haven't seen our, our generosity campaign brochure, but your words are right on the front, uh, your definition of beloved community. So I just wanna open up our conversation and dialogue with, um, with how you understand beloved community. Yeah, so thank you. Let me first say that it really is good to be back with you. And um, I was so inspired after the workshop and the conversation that the members of your church engaged in, um, in looking at the principles. Um, that's like one of the favorite things I get to do is engage our, our people in, in a deeper conversation about our theology. Um, so I, my understanding of beloved community really has grown the more I do this work, the deeper I go, the wider we go. And, and it's like, the more you do it, the, um, the clearer things get. You know, in the beginning, when you're trying to unravel something, you know, you're trying to explain it, trying to find the right words, how do you translate it? And then in time, it's like, all of a sudden things start to get like really clear. Um, and that happened with me in terms of my understanding of beloved community. I can remember being at a national event one day and a, and a minister said, well, what is the beloved community? What does it mean? And that shocked me because I just assumed that all ministers operated with at least an understanding of it. And that probably made me really start to think about how do we define it? And um, so the definition for me has kind of taken about three or four iterations. And now, and especially for those of you who were in the workshop, I see the beloved community now as a community of communities that are living out the eighth principle. So let me explain that a little bit more. I, I, I think that often people feel like if you're in a community where there is no conflict or very little friction, that that's the beloved community. Mm. And perhaps that was an adequate understanding at one point. But in light of our work around justice and inclusion, you can have a community that doesn't have conflict, but is also not open for inclusion or doesn't doesn't press itself in terms of its growing edges around justice, 
So it can be an assumption that we have already done that work and succeeded. And I think everyone, if we really look inside and if we're honest about it, we know that we haven't finished this work. We know that. And so for me now, the beloved community includes the, the, the zone, right? Where the work is actually being done on a daily basis. Not that we've done it already, but the zone where the work is actually being done is part of the dynamic of beloved community. And that, that is a change for me over you know last few years. So the beloved community being the community of communities, recognizing that different groups of people within your church, as well as in the wider society, um, are experiencing church differently or expressing Unitarian Universalism through a different cultural or experiential lens, and that is fine. Uh, so we make space for that to be, uh, to be held and to be respected and honored. And then that zone that I'm talking about where the dynamic of the beloved community, where we're actively engaged in the work around justice and inclusion, that zone is where we are in practice, really working at honoring each other and building inclusion and looking at the well being of each of those different communities. So that's a different framing for beloved community than before. And I'd love to hear your response to that as well, uh, Reverend Florence, now that I, I've said that. Well, I, what I'm struck by uh, in, in listening to you is that it's beloved community, not as a noun, but as a verb. Yeah. As, a, as a process, as an unfolding, as a continuing work, rather than, uh, you know, getting to heaven, getting to a steady state where you can say, yes, now we are beloved community, but rather um, we are um, in the ongoing uh, deepening and creation of beloved community. That's what I hear in what you said. Yeah, very good uh, way to put it. And um, also, you know, as people come and go in community, whether it's just that normal life process, you know, young people go away to college or, um, you know, parents get so busy with activities of their children that they don't get to come to church or we age and pass on. That coming and going in community is, is like this constant change. So how do, we, how do we look out for the well-being of each other? How do we look out for the well-being of the groups? And, um, and, that, and, and, and what does it mean to really do justice? You know, as we look at what's happening in the wider society, the call for justice is constantly changing and challenging us. The beloved community is the space where all of that is a part of our daily practice. And the word beloved, yeah, such a such a wonderful word. Yeah, and if you think about it, it's like it's like be love, be loved, and it and that's an ongoing process. It's not a thing that we arrive at. Thank you, thank you for that little opening into beloved community. You're welcome. And then we'll uh, start looking at uh, what the eighth principle is about and how that's connected. Okay.
Wow, wasn't that rendition of Spirit of Life from All Souls UU in Washington, D.C. Just stunning. And special thanks to Paula for giving us permission to share it today. Next, as part of our generosity campaign, you're going to hear from UUCUC member Elizabeth Simpson about what drew her to us, to this congregation, and what keeps her here. Hi, I'm Elizabeth Simpson. I moved to Urbana in 2001, and I had gone to the UU Church a few times here and there. Um, I was the peer mediation coordinator at the middle school for a long time, and I've done a lot of work with restorative justice, in particular, trying to address the harms and reparations of racial injustice and white supremacy. In 2013, I started the local chapter of CU Showing Up for Racial Justice. And a few years later, I helped found the We Want to Woke Community Justice Street Choir, which was really about having community and celebration in our justice issues. In 2016, as we recall, there was an election and leading up to that election, there was all sorts of stirrings around white nationalism and it was really terrifying. And a number of people in this community who were part of what would get called the progressive community were really eating each other alive with just, I think it was their fear coming out. And after the election happened, I thought, okay, we're gonna need some resource here and I'm gonna need some resource. So I went to the place I could think of and I actually woke up that morning, I said, I need some poetry, some music and some inspiration. I'm gonna go to the UU church. And I went and I, and I got that, I got that. And I got a sense that maybe this church could be um, a place where I could have a sort of a home base. And I, it was a sort of an inkling at the time, but what I found after week after week was that justice issues kept getting brought up, not just on a superficial level, but they were brought up and integrated as part of the service. For example, the land acknowledgement was not something that we just say, but last fall, we went deeply into understanding, well, who were the people of these lands? What is their history? What is their present? And um, it's those sort of like going beyond the naming the values that I've really appreciated about the church. And that not only do people um, do this in words, but they do it in deeds. And the, the slogan of deeds, not creeds really resonates for me here. And it's not so much that every single congregant is doing everything, but the culture of the church is one that says, can we do something about what we're saying we care about? Um, whether that is to put in your time, put in your donations. And the answer over and over has been yes. So this is a place where I don't just feel welcome. Um, I'm not interested in being welcome. I wanna belong. And this is a place where I, as someone who am deeply committed to not just liking social justice, but being and doing it in beloved community, this is a place that I feel like I belong. Thank you, Elizabeth. And thank you for your ongoing work for racial justice. As Unitarian Universalists, our seventh principle affirms that we are part of the interconnected web of life. And so each Sunday, we, we lift up our interconnections with each other, with the wider community, and with the world. Today, I want to talk about our generosity campaign. This Sunday is the second week of our four-week campaign, our annual pledge campaign to support the church for the coming year. And I want to offer huge thanks to the 32 households who have already sent in an online pledge in our first week. Thank you, thank you. But maybe you're listening this morning and you're wondering what in the world we're talking about. Generosity campaign, pledging, all of that. So I'm going to do a little pledging 101 for you this morning. Our church is entirely self-sufficient financially. What that means that is that everything you experience at UUCUC is supported by members and friends of the congregation. 
a tiny bit from a rentals. Of course, that's not happening right now, but really uh, well over 90% by members and friends. And each year in February and early March for four Sundays, we invite you to consider, to really discern in your heart how this church matters to you and how you are willing and able to support this developing beloved community uh, over the coming year. Pledges that are made now are for the church year that starts July 1st. You have the entire year after July 1st to pay your pledge in whatever way works best for you. But by pledging now, in this month, you make it possible for us to develop a budget, to plan for next year, to hopefully bring on uh, new staff, to know that we have the funds to responsibly continue this congregation for a coming year. Maybe you're listening this morning and considering how your spirit, and I invite you to consider, how has your spirit been sustained over this pandemic time by our Sunday services, our classes, our support groups, our Soul Matters groups, however it is that you have connected, or perhaps just your gratitude that there is a liberal congregation like this in your community or available online. However you're connected, perhaps you uh, can connect with those feelings, but, but maybe also finances are tight this year as they are for many people. I want to stress that the thing about pledging is that the amount is entirely up to you. What I want to say to you is that pledging is a spiritual act. It's saying, I offer my life energy expressed in this way, uh, the energy from my work, from however it is that I have uh, financial support for the energy of this community, this ongoing work of creating community. For some, that is thousands of dollars. For some, that is hundreds of dollars. For some, it is less even than $100, whatever it is. And Steve, could you put up that slide? Recognizing the range of our financial capacity and honoring that, the UUA put out a giving guide where you choose the level of your heart commitment to a congregation. Uh, so you choose the level of support you want to for the church, and it is tied to a percentage of your income. So what this means, you can see these four categories. Whoever you are, whatever your income is, you can be a supporter, a sustainer, a visionary, or a transformer. And we honor all those levels of commitment and support. Many of you, if you've pledged before, received a pledge packet in the mail, or maybe you got an email from our, I think it came from our board chair, uh, Brian McDermott, with links to a web page with everything that you could possibly want to know about our hopes and dreams for next year, about how to pledge, uh, the, the giving guide that um, you just saw a little bit of. But maybe you're not yet a member or friend of this congregation, but you are feeling inspired to support us. There is a link to our Giving and Pledging 2021-22 page right on the YouTube page below the video with other information. And there is also a link in this week's e-news if you get our e-news. Please visit, browse around, read about our plans, and, and know that new pledges are just incredibly affirming for us. It tells us that what we are doing matters to you. Finally, I want to thank Mona Shannon, who is the chair of our generosity team and the entire team. 
you have no idea <laughs> how much effort it takes to pull all of that together, all those materials, the brochure, designing the brochure. It's immense. And those people are chewing their fingernails right now, wondering how it's all going to go. And they are all volunteering their life energy for this. What a beautiful expression of beloved community. All month we have special events associated with this time and um, today is one of them. At one o'clock today we are having a um, visioning for our social and environmental justice going forward here at UUCUC. Some people have signed up in advance but if you didn't get a chance to and you'd like to join us for a couple of hours with the Reverend Scott Asing from uh, the uh, statewide um, justice organization. We really hope that you'll consider joining us and you can find the Zoom information on our members and friends page uh, um, so that you could, if you haven't signed up ahead of time, you could still find it. Hope to see you there. Also, as part of our commitment to the wider community, each Sunday we share half of our Sunday offering with an organization that is doing good work in the world. And this month, our shared offering is to see you at home. And for those who are not familiar with them, they run three emergency shelters as well as a drop-in center here for those um, friends who do not have homes. And Given the weather of this month, um, I have no doubt that their work has saved lives. So please uh, support them generously. Uh, you'll see directions on how to give uh, during our offertory. Before we move into the second part of my conversation with Paula Cole-Jones about the eighth principle, I want to share that proposed language. The folks who are part of our church's racial justice project will be offering opportunities over the coming months to move deeper into discernment about the eighth principle. And I hope that we will be voting at our next annual meeting to affirm the eighth principle and join the groundbreaking congregations who have already affirmed it. 
Here are the words. We, the member congregations of the Unitarian Universalist Association, covenant to affirm and promote journeying toward spiritual wholeness by working to build a diverse, multicultural, beloved community by our actions that accountably dismantle racism and other oppressions in ourselves and our institutions. Well, let's talk about the AIDS principle. And uh, most of you listening this morning are probably familiar with the seven principles of Unitarian Universalism. And you might not know that there is something called the AIDS principle project and congregations that have chosen to become AIDS principle congregations. Uh, but we have just the person here this morning to share with us about the AIDS principle. So yes, the eighth principle is actually something that has grown out of UU community, uh, anti-racist community in particular, kind of organically. And um, so it, it says that we covenant to affirm and promote as all of our principles began, journeying towards spiritual wholeness by accountably building a multicultural, diverse, beloved community by our actions <clears throat> to dismantle racism and oppression in ourselves and our institutions. And um, so the eighth principle comes from the recognition that we, we can embrace the seven Unitarian Universalist principles and not realize that we are not attending to this work around justice and inclusion. So just as we talked about the, the definition of beloved community, I don't know that we will actually build beloved community without attention to what the eighth principle is calling us to do. We won't build the beloved community if we are not ongoingly working to make sure that people are included which requires us being able to address the range of oppressions, be able, being able to address racism. Because if that goes unspoken and unaddressed, we will have more of the traditional community where people are welcome, but they're really asked to fully assimilate. And it doesn't mean that we are conscious enough of other experiences and how to meet the needs. So this, Florence, I believe is going to lead to a spiritual awakening in Unitarian Universalism and a renewal of Unitarian Universalism. So for those of you who are listening, who participated in the workshop, think about how much like fresh new thought was uh, uh, you know, shared that people engaged in. And that, that was just a small amount in just a couple of hours. Think about when that becomes a norm, the way that we will be thinking kind of the depth and the connection and our ability to see beyond our own experiences, beyond our own comfort and make these connections. I really get excited about it. So the eighth principle then comes out of the recognition that the seven principles can be interpreted fairly narrowly, although they, they're universal, they are, but our interpretations of it, we can interpret them all through our individual experience as opposed to the community of communities. We can interpret it all through our, our comfort in terms of where we have landed in terms of privilege right? So whether it's gender privilege or heterosexual privilege or um, economic privilege, racial privilege, whatever they are, ableism, whatever they are, privilege often 
um, keeps us from seeing that it's not that way for other people. And so rather than insisting that things be done in a way that keep us comfortable, the eighth principle calls us to look beyond our own comfort to what does it mean to be in community? What does it mean to be in a diverse community? And that everyone feels like they belong, that they matter. The seven principles really do give us a framework for it, but they're not enough to call us into collective practice. Yeah, so it comes from, it's like, this is our unfinished work. And the eighth principle calls us to step into this. Now, another thing about it is it makes us more relevant to today because the world that you know people are being born into today is very different than the world that even you and I were born into or certainly our parents, which may be the generation of some of the older people in the church. Young people have a very different starting point. And I believe that we owe them the congregations that reflect that. And we're on our way, but we're not there yet. Well, and as you said, that's an ongoing process uh, anyway. And, you know, I feel that same sense of excitement that you expressed, even when I think about how our general assemblies have changed in the last uh, few years. Um, there's just a whole different energy. There's a whole different set of possibilities. Uh, and can you just say, a little bit about, so when churches vote on uh, the eighth principle and, and affirm it, pass it, how does that fit in with the possibility of that becoming association-wide? Yes, so thanks for asking. <clears throat> there are two different tracks. Um, we launched this as a grassroots movement so that congregations would vote on the eighth principle and adopt it and have it operating at the local level. In fact, if it were to pass at the national level and we were not doing it locally, then it wouldn't have a lot of um, impact anyway. And, and this is real important because the local congregation is where most people encounter Unitarian Universalism, either through your church or by meeting someone from your church in the community. So if it's not happening there, it's having little or no impact. Then we also want it to happen nationally as well because we know how important those principles are to us. There is a process we introduced uh, at the General Assembly in 2017, we introduced the eighth principle for the first time nationally. And we asked that the study commission, article two study commission, which is to be activated about every 15 years to review our principles, our sources, and our purposes. We ask that that be initiated um, and that they would consider the eighth principle. It was initiated in June, 2020, and the Article II Commission is working. We are still pursuing the grassroots movement. And I wanna say this, the Article II Commission could do wonderful work we have a lot of work to do. And um, we could bring it before General Assembly. The last time proposed changes were brought to the General Assembly, they failed by 13 votes, mm. only 13 votes. We don't know what will happen when it comes to a national vote. Um, it could pass, it could fail. It may come before the national and it might not even look like an eighth principle, but it will definitely be infused in the final work. But whether whatever happens nationally, if we embrace it locally, one that gives more support for the national, but two, congregations will have it, they'll own it. Right now, there are about 33 congregations that have. We're only five weeks into the year and three congregations have voted since the beginning of this year. There are a lot of congregations 
that are in this conversation and many that have dates for their votes. Um, so we're expecting really a flood of votes to happen this year between now and, and June, which is when most congregations have their annual meeting between May and June. Did I answer your question? Thank you. <laughs> You're welcome. I hope that this conversation with Paula Cole Jones is, is opening up possibilities in your mind and heart. Uh, and as part of our service every week, we recognize that we, we bring things to our time together, <laughs> wherever we may be, uh, our own individual joys and sorrows that may lift us up or weigh heavy on our hearts. And so we take time in each service to honor those both silently and uh, out loud. Uh, we have a blessing song that we have been singing for the last couple of years. And um, you can let that song wash over you as a blessing. You can join in if you wish. Uh, and then also you can send in a written joy or sorrow to uh, be read aloud. You'll see the email address on your screen. And there's a, a special gift today for our uh, time of the blessing song, a special gift from our choir. I hope that was a nice surprise. And I want to also thank uh, um, Austin Cody, who did the arrangement of that song for the choir, and our amazing Paul Weston, who has been doing the magic to create our virtual choirs for us. Uh, so many thanks to both of you. Uh, 
Uh, uh, we have a few joys and sorrows to be shared aloud today. Uh, sometimes there's a little delay with something getting to me. So if we don't read your joy or sorrow aloud today, it will be in our e-news on Wednesday. From the Herzogs. This week, our son will go to school in person for the first time in a year, entering his high school building for the first time. We are both excited for the connections and sense of normalcy this may offer him and also nervous about the risks this involves. May all the students going back this week flourish in their respective environments and may they stay safe and healthy. From the Pitchell family, sorrow for the loss of our colleague Greg Gulick due to COVID-19. From Beth Simpson, a joy. Joy for surprise kindness from strangers. A person in Ohio from whom I was trying to buy a car part online said, why don't I just send it to you for free? After he realized I was a musician. That means he paid $25 to ship an item I was getting. He said, I'm in a band. I know times are tough for musicians and I like your politics. I'm sending him a CD in thanks. From Sally Fritchie, Reverend Sally. A candle of sorrow for my grandpa Barris, Barry, who died of COVID complications on Thursday. Please lift up my father and his siblings in your hearts. The grief is made so much heavier by not being able to be with their dad in his final days. And we also offer our love and condolences to you, Reverend Sally. And from Anthony uh, Brienza, who is a, a new member, uh, along with his wife, Sue, last week. To my wife, Sue, of 11 weeks, 2 days, 6 hours, 32 minutes, and 50 seconds, give or take 10 minutes, whose birthday it is this week. I love you with all my heart. You're like a work of art. You're my BFF. I'm your personal chef. My love for you is forever and forever we'll be together. Happy birthday. Love, Anthony. And now we'll have a time of reflection, prayer, meditation, holding these and other joys and sorrows in our hearts. This has been such a wonderful conversation. I think of it as an ongoing conversation. And I'd like to close with asking you what your dream or vision is of what is truly possible for Unitarian Universalism. Yeah, thank you. That's a big question. And um, as I answer, I'll try to embody much more than just my own personal opinion. Unitarian Universalist theology really is universal. And I think, and, and especially for young people today, um, our, our UU values, our social norms 
at one point we were progressive and out front on the on the cutting edge, but now there there are social norms for young people. Our churches should be overflowing with young people. So that's one thing that that I'm looking at: youth, young adults, people who want to bring their children for the kind of um, religious education opportunities that that are provided. That's when I started. I was a very young girl in religious education, and that has led to all of this. So part of what you're seeing is the shaping of a person with these UU values. Um, but I also um, think many of us see that, you know, there, there are many people for whom this theology resonates people of diverse backgrounds, you know, gender, age, sexual orientation, uh, all, all of who we are in our humanity. And we want to be, you know, when we come, we want to experience it fully in terms of our humanity. And, um, you know, right now it happens in some places, at times it gets quite strained and, you know, people might have one foot in, one foot out. That's a part of the growing process. But my hope is that we will be able to make these, to evolve to a point where that zone of active beloved community is one that holds many people, many people. I think we also have the opportunity in this pandemic has shown us that we can uh, do church in many different ways. And so it may be that we are offering church more widely um, for people who will have greater sense of access um, than we have now. So, um, and, and it was said very nicely by one of the ministers, uh, we had a, we engaged ministers in a conversation and Reverend McKinley Sims from Restoration in, Pennsylvania, in Philadelphia. He said, he said that people in his church, now that you know they have the eighth principle that they're enjoying the services more, they've been very deliberate in their work. And he said, this is not just about the diversity of people, but theolog theological material and music. And he said, and if we continue to do this, then what we will all have in common is diversity that diversity will be the thing that we have in common. Isn't that beautiful? Isn't that simple? And so that's part of, I think part of what we want to do is center the diversity and really honor it and respect it and see where it takes us. It'll take us in some new directions and um, we should all be excited about that. It'll be a challenge, but we should be excited. I want Unitarian Universalism to fulfill its promise it's a big promise and, um, and that we will be so relevant that it'll be the choice that people make. And I will say one last thing, this is the personal. I'm, I hope one day I will have grandchildren. My daughter will probably get me for saying this. I would like for Unitarian Universalism to be the choice that subsequent generations of my family would choose. I don't think I can guarantee that unless this piece that we're talking about is embraced. So I, I think we have a bright future if we can shift today and, and use this as an opportunity for growth and expansion. Um, and I think that Unitarian Universalists will grow in numbers as well. Thank you so much. Paula, joining us again for being part of our journey. You are now part of our journey and we are um, just uh, honored and thrilled that you could join us this morning and uh, many, many blessings on your lifelong, ongoing, lifelong work towards a more liberatory uh, justice and diversity centered Unitarian Universalism. Yes. Thank you again. You're welcome. Thank you for the invitation and good luck to you in your journey. I'm here. Call me if you need. Thanks.
In closing, I really want to thank Paula Cole Jones, both for her generosity with us this morning and for her ongoing work to transform Unitarian Universalism. I also uh, realized as we moved through Joys and Sorrows that we did not lift up what is happening in Texas right now. And I feel, uh, I feel moved to do that, to recognize that there are millions of people still without power, still without water, and, uh, and some of them facing uh, astronomical utility bills. And of course, we know that in this culture that is built on systemic racism and uh, so much inequality that uh, many of the communities that are hit hardest uh, will be the black and brown communities of Texas. And so just um, I hold all those who are suffering in Texas in my heart and I urge us all to do what we can to uh, support frontline communities there during this crisis, this true humanitarian emergency. My closing words from last week are still resonating with me this week. They were, uh, they were uh, in honor of Valentine's Day, but I think that they uh, still hold true, especially after my conversation with Paula Cole Jones. Because love, is the foundation of all that we do for racial justice. Love is the foundation for all that we do in our journey towards beloved community. And love is the foundation of who we are as a congregation. You are loved. You are love itself, love incarnate. Love deep and broad as the oceans that gave you life. You are a shining node in the great net of love that holds the stars and the vastness of space. You are a child of love, born from and nourished by the earth with each breath. You are loved you are beloved. Go in peace. this flame but not the light of truth the warmth of community and the fire of commitment these we carry in our hearts until, until we, we are, are together, together again, again.